Hey guys, it's uh, good to see you guys. Uh, if you're new here today, my name is Charlie. I'm one of the pastors of our Cross Seeds Youth Worship, and we're just so uh, encouraged and thankful that you've tuned in and made this your place of worship. And so we want to just go over just a couple of announcements to get you familiar with our ministry as well as get you involved in some of the things that we have planned. And as you guys watch this from home, we want to encourage you guys right now to look in your YouTube description to uh, download our bulletin so that you could follow along with us. If you're new here again, we want to extend our heartfelt welcome to you. And after our, uh, after our worship, we have something called small groups. And so if we want to plug you in right away. And so if you find yourself new but not knowing where to go after our worship service, my contact information is in the bulletin. So, hey, please reach out to me and we'll make sure that you get into the right small group discussion. The next announcement that we have is our Friday Together worship. Our Friday Together is a family worship that we do together with our families where we learn about the basic principles of what Christians believe believe through a system and a way called the New City Catechism. Again, we want to encourage you to do it with your families, but also if you find yourself wanting to just do this on your own, we have a link available for you guys in the description, in the bulletin to uh, get you access to that material. So hope that you guys can do that. Our next announcement is our sun Sunday online worship happens 1125 every time on this channel so if you haven't already please subscribe to this channel and please be here 1125 so that you don't miss the announcements as well as just our greeting time here next announcement is we have sunday prayer meeting every single sunday from 7 to 8 p.m this is our opportunity in the midst of the pandemic to grow our heart's desire to see god move in our lives in our church in our parents lives and through this nation for those that are sick, for those that are working, and for the church who can't meet up right now. So it's been an encouraging time, and the best thing that we can do in this time separated is to pray. And so if you have a heart of prayer, and I hope that that's forming in you in this time, please join us 7 to 8 p.m. The link, again, is in the bulletin. Last announcement is we have Wednesday Youth Night. Wednesday Youth Night is just a fun time where we can connect and play games. Last week we played Mafia over Zoom. It's possible, I found that out. And so we had just an awesome time. And so we're gonna be playing some more games, connecting with one another, praying for each other at the end. And so, hey, come join us, especially if you feel like you've been lonely or uh, detached from our church, we want you there. And so please join us 7 to 8 p.m. on Wednesday nights. And so hope to see you guys there. We're gonna transition now to our call to worship where we're gonna come to God as God has spoken through his word. And so with that being said, in reverence to God's word, I know this feels a little strange, but I want you to stand up as we come and prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm 105 verses one through three. And I'll be reading the leader portion and then we'll read the all together portion together. Hear now the reading of God's word. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, praise him, tell all of his wondrous works. All together, ready, begin. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And as we close our eyes and bow our heads, may we ask the Lord here today to form in us a heart of worship as we come to him now with singing. Let's pray. Good morning, Cross Seats. Um, I hope that you guys are doing well and staying, staying safe in your homes. Um, before we come before God and worship, I want to encourage you guys to have a posture of worship uh, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And that means maybe like sitting up in your seats um, and focusing on the lyrics and worshiping God and remembering who He is. And so I want to encourage you guys to be mindful um, during your singing. Try not to be too comfortable, um, but let's worship God. Um, rightfully in a way that he deserves to be worshipped. And so we'll, we will be getting our singing time with um, Come Ye Sinners. Come ye sinners 
poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore, and Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. Come ye thirsty, come and welcome God's free bounty, glorified, true belief and true repentance, and every grace that brings you now. Now will arise and go to Jesus. Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms And in the arms of my dear Savior Oh, there are ten thousand charms Come ye weary, heavy laden Lost and ruined by the fall And if you tarry until you're better You will never come at all And I will arise and go to Jesus He will embrace me in His arms And in the arms of my dear Savior For there are ten thousand charms I will arise and go to Jesus He will embrace me in His arms And in the arms of my dear Savior there are ten thousand charms. Let's sing verse one one last time. Come, ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and ruined, sick and sore, and Jesus ready. Stand to save you, full of pity, love and power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus and your great love for us, God. Lord, you're so willing to give us yourself and to love us. And Father, Lord, there are times where God, we wait and we stay in our sin. But Father, would you remind us of our need for you? And God, would you remind us that, Lord, you are the one who satisfies us, not our sins, not our worldly desires. And so God, bring us back to yourself, Lord. During this time, Lord, would we um, be continuously reminded of your great love for us? And God, would you captivate us, Lord, once again? We thank you so much and we praise you, Lord. And it's in uh, your son's name we pray. Amen. What gifts of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this i hold my hope is only jesus for my life is wholly bound to him oh how strange and divine i can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ. The 
The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, He will I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure. The price it has been paid For Jesus bled And suffered for my part And He was raised To overthrow the grave To this I hold My sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my can sing, I am free, and not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for He has said, I hold, my hope is only Jesus, home of the glory evermore to me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, and not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, Till my lips shall repeat and not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long this is my story this is my song Fix a mission, perfect.
perfect delight Visions of rapture Now burst on my sight Angels descending Bring from above Echoes of mercy This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my story This is my song In my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, I'm happy and Watching and waiting Looking above Filled with His goodness Lost in His love This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Heavenly Father, God, that is our story, Lord, that Christ died and bled for us. And Lord, we now live a life that's not ours, Lord, and we have a new life in Christ. And so, Father, we pray that as we continue to think about that, Lord, would we have confidence, Lord? Would we have confidence in Christ? And Lord, would he give us confidence to obey your word and to follow you, Lord, in every part of our lives? God, we know that Right now is a difficult situation, but Father, we pray that, Lord, would you help us to be obedient to, to you and to your commandments, Lord, even during this time. Father, would you be glorified um, through our obedience to you, God. We thank you so much, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How do you answer the question, who are you? You may simply just say your name and think about that as a ridiculous question, but one scroll through your Instagram bio it helps capture who you think that you are. Maybe you consider yourself being what you do. You're a runner, basketball player, or key club president. Or maybe you associate who you are with where you are. Diamond Bar High School, Walnut High School, UCLA class of blah, 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 blah. Or maybe some of us associate who we are with our friend group, who we're with. BFFs with at something, 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 or soulmate to at something, something, something. Hey, if you're a junior higher watching this, be careful who you tie your soul to at an early age. But all this to say that these titles that we give ourselves are not just labels, but they make up who we are. We find that these things can give us some sense of identity. Some of us, even in our Instagram bios, may even include Christian or the name of our church. And I think that's pretty cool that you are okay or cool with people associating you with being Christian or going to this church. But if they had social media accounts back in the day that First Peter was written, I don't think a lot of them would share their church's name or that they're Christian 
Why? Because during this time, Christians uh, felt a lot of shame for being Christians. They were an unaccepted minority. They were treated unjustly by the government, discriminated against, mocked for their faith, persecuted, subject of gossip and targets of hate crimes. So the audience of 1 Peter would know just how hard it was to be identified as a Christian. They were kicked out of their homes. We covered that in the first sermon, that this letter was written to the elect exiles of the dispersion. So what had happened because of their Christian faith was that they were kicked out of the city of Rome and forced to live in these Roman colonies around Asia, all because of their faith. You could see why a lot of people in this time would feel some kind of shame to be a Christian. Peter, however, is going to tell us that our Christian identity is nothing to be ashamed of as he unpacks for us the great joy we have in being a Christian. From our sermon here today, we're going to talk about two simple points, who we are and how we get this identity. Who we are and how we get our identity. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. We're continuing our series through 1 Peter, entitled Life as an Exile. It's going to teach us how we live in this world as Christians. And today we're going to talk about our Christian identity, who we are. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Hear now the reading of God's word. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. Thus ends the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. May he write his eternal truth upon our hearts here today. The first part about the text here today is who we are. Peter identifies who we are. And as a Christian, your identity has these two qualities. You have the presence of God, and you are now the people of God. Now, let's go one by one. What do I mean by God's presence? If you look down with me at verse 5, you will see that the Christian is a living stone that is being built into a spiritual house. This means just as the temple was a place where the presence of God dwelled, now God's presence dwells inside the Christian. The spiritual house where God's presence dwells is now in the believer through the Holy Spirit. Jesus says this from John chapter 14, verses 16 through 17, where he promises the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, will be in the believer forever. The presence of God is in a believer now, not in a physical place or location. Now, this is good news for the exiled believer. You can imagine this because they were stripped away. They were kicked out of their own place of worship and cast off into exile. If I was a, uh, a member of that church during that time, I would miss just my friends from the church, not being able to see them again. I would miss the sights and sounds of the worship that would make me nostalgic. I would miss my pastor and the routine of how church did our worship, what kind of food that they served, and so on and so forth. But even if I were kicked out of that place, one thing I wouldn't miss out on is God's presence. Because God's presence was never tied down to that place. But because of the Holy Spirit, I know that I can worship God wherever I am. The presence of God is not in a place, but the presence of God is found in them. And I think this is so relatable for us right now. 
for those of us that's missing church, man, I get you. We are missing seeing one another, hugging one another, the routine of doing things, the sights and the smells of this building. And yet, if you were to come to me and say, Pastor Charlie, in our time of quarantine right now, I feel like I cannot worship God because I cannot come to church. I would say to you, rather firmly but gently, that is not Christianity. You see, other religions designate holy places because they believe the presence of God dwells within these holy places, whether it be a shrine or a temple or some secluded place in the mountains. They may believe that contained within these places lie the presence of their gods. For the Christian, we can worship God anywhere because God's presence doesn't dwell in a place, but rather in people who have come by faith. No matter where we are, we can worship God because His presence is in us. And what a timely truth for us, experiencing church right now in exile, in your pajamas, in the comforts of your living room, or in your bedroom. You and I can worship God because the presence of God is not tied to a place. It's tied to people who have trusted in Christ. But that's not all. We don't just have the presence of God. Our identity as believers teach us today that we are now the people of God. Look down with me at verse 9. It says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When you read this list, Peter is making the point that the church is the new people of God. If you were to look at Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 through 6, or Isaiah chapter 43, verses 20 to 21, that very list that's contained in verse 9 is the same way that God describes his people Israel. These titles were given to Israel. So what's Peter's point? Peter's point is that the church is now the new people of God, not based on race, but by faith. Now, why is that significant? Because being God's people means this, that we are welcomed, cared for, and loved by God. We belong to Him. We are His treasured possession. And this is good news because this identity is one that will not fade away even in times of suffering. You know, not all of our identities are suffering proof. It may take a pandemic for us to realize how artificial and temporary our self-made identities are. When we choose to build our identities on our achievement, our image, our talents, we must realize at what great lengths it'll take to have and also keep those identities. For those of us who take great pride in our image, you know, basing your identity and what people think of you and how you're perceived has a way of making us hopelessly self-centered, constantly thinking about how you look and who's looking, what kind of clothes you're wearing, what should you buy, what should you eat, who should you hang out with. To keep up our image is a tiring, tiring thing. We always need to know, or we always need to make sure we're taking photos with the right people that we're always wearing something new and fashionable, not something outdated and old, or doing something exciting and fun where people will like and be jealous of. And we feel that pressure every single day to produce content, be a certain way, look a certain way, do a certain thing. And our desire to be identified as cool or pretty or popular, hey, how's that been for you? How tiring has that been? How tiring has it been emotionally? as you're insecure about whether your next photo or your next video will get enough likes and comments. Don't you feel that dread every time you post something new, wondering if it'll be liked in that same way? Isn't it a drain for you financially or maybe for your parents financially? Always trying to keep up with the latest trend, always trying to make sure that your life looks uh, popular and filtered and fun with all of these different friends. Or how tiring has it been for you physically as you're trying to get the perfect body, as you subscribe and go through these different diet plans and exercises that your body was not made for just so that you could look a certain way. We can agree that these self-made identities can be torturous. But why do we subscribe to these torturous regimes? Why do we put our bodies and ourselves 
souls and our minds through such uh, extreme measures, it's because we want to be loved, cared for, and accepted. And we think that if we look a certain way, or if we have certain things, then those things will be given to us, and that those things will satisfy us. And it will, to a point, because when we fail, or when we become unhip, or we make the wrong moves or make the wrong friends, we will soon realize that our self-made identity is fulfilling, but only based on conditions. It'll be fulfilling when we look and act a certain way, but not for long. Because you see, just like drinking salt water, that temporary success or that rush we get from getting likes or getting a comment from someone that we want attention from, is fulfilling and satisfying for a bit, but it just makes us thirstier for more. These kinds of gra gratitude and joy that we have from these self-made identities help us to realize that the love that we get from these constructed identities is conditional. But the good news of God is that God's love is not conditional. You see God's people, God made his people and he promises for us to be God's people. And it was never based on our achievements, our talents, or our gifts. No, if you look down with me at verse 10, it tells us the reason why you and I can become God's people. It's because of God's mercy. Being God's people is a gift. And if we did not earn it, we cannot lose it. God's love and being God's people it's an unconditional promise. It's an identity that will never fade away. It will survive any suffering, any disappointment, and any flaw. Why? Because being his chosen race, his treasured possession, his people, it was always based on grace. Well, this sounds like good news, but how do we gain God's presence? How do we become God's people? And the simple answer to that is that we are his people. We gain God's presence through Christ. Through Christ, who is the chief cornerstone, is how you and I get our identity. And that's point number two here today. We get our identity through Christ. Let's look with me at verses four through seven. It says this, as you come to him, that's Jesus Christ, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the corner stone. The identity we have is through Christ, just as he, Jesus Christ, is called the living stone in verse 4. Now notice in verse 5, the text tells us that you and I too are living stones. How? Because of our connection to him. Believers are called the spiritual house. We have God's presence, but Christ is the cornerstone of that house. He is the foundation. You see, the only way we can be the people of God and have the presence of God is only if we choose to build on Christ. If Christ is our cornerstone and we have built our lives, centered our lives upon him. The presence of God can come to us through Jesus who brought God's presence to us through his death. Now, if you remember, in the temple, there was a curtain there that divided two rooms. And it divided, this curtain divided this place called the Holy of Holies. And it was the place where God's physical presence dwelled. Only one day out of the year, by one person, the high priest, that person was able to enter into the Holy of Holies and make a sacrifice on behalf of the nation of Israel. This place, the Holy of Holies, was as exclusive as exclusive can be. However, upon Jesus' death, the writers of the gospel write a detail 
that when Jesus Christ died, that curtain that separated the people from the Holy of Holies was torn in half. It was torn from top and bottom. So what does that show us? It shows us this, that the presence of God is not located behind a curtain any longer. Through the death of Christ, the presence of God is now in every believer who has trusted in Christ for their salvation. That is good news for us. But what about the people? How do you and I become the people of God? Again, it is through Christ. Throughout the Bible in Psalms, Jeremiah, and Hosea, God calls the people of Israel a vine. But as he talks about the vine or the image of the vine that God gives is this. God planted his people. He cared for his people. He nurtured his people. And just like a good farmer does, a farmer expects a vine to produce fruit. However, according to the book of Hosea, the people of Israel, this vine had nothing coming out of it. It had no fruit. Why? Because the people of Israel were disobedient. They failed to be the people of God as they chose to live out other identities apart from God. Now, Jesus in John chapter 15 says this, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. That means Jesus is the true person of God, living a life of complete obedience to God. Where Israel failed as a people of God, Christ succeeded as the person of God. As Israel failed in temptation in the wilderness for 40 years, Christ successfully handled temptation. He was faithful and obedient to God for 40 days as he fasted in the wilderness. Where Israel failed, Christ succeeded. And those who trust in Christ, who believe in him, John 15 says, are attached to the vine. They are branches that are attached to the vine. We can produce good fruit not because of our obedience or our good works, but believers, you and I can produce fruit you and I can be the people of God because we're attached to the life-giving vine. We become the people of God because we're attached, or biblically speaking, we abide in Christ. How do we become the people of God? It is through Christ. How do we have the presence of God? It is through Christ. Our hope to have God's presence and to be God's people rests upon Jesus Christ. It is only through Christ that you and I can have this new identity. So I want to invite you, if you are not a believer today, to put your trust in Jesus who has done this work for you. All your other identities cannot fulfill you. They will let you go if you fail them, but not Jesus. You see, Jesus can truly fulfill you where other identities cannot. And when you fail him, he will always forgive you. No other identity will say that. No other identities will fill you like that. Only Jesus can. But how do I receive it? Verse 10, it is by God's mercy. It is a gift of grace to, have, to become his people and to have his presence in your life today. Trust in Christ and say, I will not build my life upon anything else anymore. I will build my life upon who Jesus is and what he has done for me. When you accept him as the cornerstone, the cornerstone, the foundation of your life, that is what it means for us to turn to Christ and believe in him today. But if you are not a Christian here today, the Bible tells us some sobering news that the text tells us we are not a Christian, not because we didn't try hard enough or not because we are moral enough, no, the text tells us that we are not a Christian because you and I have rejected Jesus Christ. You have rejected the cornerstone. And the message of the gospel is not good news, but in verse 7, it is a stumbling block to you, a rock of offense to you. You stumble over the gospel because you choose, deliberately choose to build your life on something else other than Christ. You are offended. It is a rock of offense to you of the claims of Christianity, what Christ has done, that Christ is the only way. It is not good news to you. And because of this, you do not have any part of being God's people or being in God's presence. And so I pray for you here today that you may receive Christ as Lord and Savior if you have not done so today. All you need to do is come to Christ. Come to Christ, even in the midst of your sin. Come to Christ for salvation. If you're a believer here today, the Bible here says that we are to offer spiritual sacrifices to God.
If you look down with me at verse 5, it tells us that as a believer, our purpose in our lives is to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. But what does it mean for us to offer spiritual sacrifice? Because back in those days, in the Old Testament times, people would offer sacrifices to atone for their sins. But if Christ fully paid the punishment and the payment for all of our sins, what does our spiritual sacrifice look like? Well, if you can turn to Hebrews chapter 13, verses 16, it actually will tell us, so flip a couple pages forward to Hebrews 13, verse 16, and it'll tell us what this kind of spiritual sacrifice is. It says this, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, did you catch that? Did you catch what it means to give a spiritual sacrifice that is pleasing to God? It is not about us lifting our hands high in worship, harmonizing or showcasing our faithfulness in Bible study and wearing a suit to watching an online sermon. If you do that, by the way, kudos to you. But that is not a spiritual sacrifice to God. What is a spiritual sacrifice? To do good to do good to those that are around you. A spiritual sacrifice is when you sacrifice your time, your energy, your strength, your finances for the good of those that God has surrounded you with. It doesn't mean about us harmonizing or knowing all these Bible verses in the old King James Version. If you do that again, kudos to you, but that is not a spiritual sacrifice. You know what a spiritual sacrifice looks like? It is you helping your younger sibling out with their homework tonight, even when you are swamped with your own. It may mean for us doing the dishes for our family, even when no one has asked us to. It may look like for us, especially for those of us that are older, reaching down to those younger students in our ministry to see how they're doing. Now, that doesn't seem so holy, and that doesn't seem so spiritual. And yet, the spiritual sacrifice that God accepts is for us to do good to those that are around us. Hey, let me ask you a personal question here today. If I were to ask your mom or your sibling or your friends if they consider you a sacrificial person or not, what do you think that they would say? Because the level of our sacrifice to those that God has given to us will show and show us whether we are offering sacrifices, worship that is acceptable or pleasing to God. So if you're a believer here today, I want to encourage you to do good and sacrifice for those that are around you. Secondly, if you are a believer here today, I love 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where it tells us here that we are to uh, proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. That is the second thing that we do as believers. We declare the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Now, what is that? That is you and I sharing our salvation testimony. We talk about how God called us out of darkness. We were in the realm of darkness, of sin and brokenness, and only by the mercies of God were we brought into his marvelous light when he saved us. And so we declare to our friends and our family members, to our friends that do not know Christ, the great salvation that we've received from Him. That is what we do as His people who has His presence. One of the stories that caught my attention this week was a man by the name of Minkai had passed away. His name might not be familiar with you, but his life was documented in the movie End of Spear. The movie details how five missionaries desiring to reach a tribe in Ecuador, these Ecuadorian Indians for the gospel, ended up being brutally killed by the warriors of that tribe that they were trying to reach out. Minkai was one of those warriors who savagely speared two out of the five of those missionaries. You see, Minkai and his tribe during that time had a culture of violence. That's why the Christians in those times wanted to reach out to them. Darkness surrounded their tribe and through an endless cycle of tribal warfare, it was only a matter of time that Minkai would be murdered as well. That was until God stepped in 
and God called Minkai out of darkness. You see, what makes this gospel story so amazing is that the same families of those five murdered missionaries came back to evangelize to those same Ecuadorian Indians that had killed their husbands and their friends. But this time, the result was different. The tribe accepted the gospel, and Minkai being one of them. And Minkai went on to preach to his tribe as a pastor and even toured the U.S. as he declared the praises of the God who called him out of darkness and into his marvelous light. These are his words. We lived angry, hating and killing until these missionaries brought us God's word. Now, those of us who walk God's trail live happily and in peace. He was in darkness, but now he's brought into God's marvelous life, happiness and peace, because he is following God's trail. He had a platform to speak of God's amazing mercy while he was stuck, trapped in his life of darkness. And as he has that platform to share, if you're a Christian here today, even if you weren't part of a tribe that was known for its violence, you and I were called by God out of a similar darkness. We were stuck, enslaved to our culture, to our passions, to our lust, to our desires, to our self-centered ambition, to other gods. We were stuck in our own darkness. It is only by the mercies of God that He would call us out, draw us in to His presence. And if you have experienced salvation today, you and I have a platform to share, not a great, how great of a person you and I are, but how God saved us while we were stuck in our sins, how He called us out from darkness into His marvelous light. That is why we can sing that third song that we sang. We could sing with such confidence, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. He saw me when I was stuck in my sin, and He called me out into the light. May you and I think of different people that we could share our testimony here with today as we give all glory to God, the one who has made us His people, who has given us His presence through Christ. And with that privilege we have as being a Christian and identifying as a Christian, let us now do good for those around us and proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let me pray for us here. Father, we thank you again for your mercy and love through Christ. Through him, we could receive an identity that God doesn't come from our own doing, but Father is kept for us by your promise, by grace in Christ. Lord God, we want to pray for every single heart here that we would not foolishly build on any other foundation but upon the rock that is Jesus Christ. He is the only rock, the only sure centered identity and foundation in our lives that will not break when there's storms, when there are hardships, he will not run. But Father, we will see that in Christ, we have an identity and a hope that will withstand the test of time, will withstand any kind of suffering, and that Father will be a source of hope from now all the way to eternity. So Father, we pray every single heart here would trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. He is chosen and precious by you. He is the way of salvation for anyone who would believe. And so Father, we pray that you would call us to believe in him here today. Father, we love you for your mercy that you have shown to us. Now as we leave, Help us, God, to do good for those around us and to declare your excellencies to all those that are around us too, so that, God, we may give glory to you as your people who have your presence. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now receive the benediction in Christ. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Hey, God bless you guys. I hope you guys have a great time in small group as you guys discuss what it means for us to identify as a Christian. And we hope to see you guys next week. God bless you guys. Have a good one.
Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore, and Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power, come ye thirsty, come and welcome, God's free bounty, glorify, true belief and true repentance. And every grace that brings you now And I will arise and go to Jesus He will embrace me in His arms And in the arms of my dear Savior Oh, there are ten thousand charms Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. And if you tarry until you're better, you will never come at all. And I will arise and go to Jesus. Embrace me in his arms And in the arms of my dear Savior For there are ten thousand charms I will arise and go to Jesus He will embrace me in his arms of my dear Savior for there are ten thousand charms let's sing verse one one last time come ye sinners poor and needy weak and ruined sick and sore Jesus ready stands to save you full of pity love and power